Hello students, this is part two of chapter five on security and ethics and all the great things that we need to be concerned with when it comes to protecting and also understanding how we might violate laws as it pertains to software. So we're going to cover the theft of software, theft of information, theft of hardware, vandalism, talk about failures. What happens when my hard drive fails? Well, that's going to lead us into backing up and also wireless security. So let's go ahead and get started. Software theft clearly occurs when someone steals software media. So this has gotten a little harder to do as we download software today from the internet, but it doesn't mean, for example, that we couldn't download a piece of software, have a key that could be used on multiple computers that we own, and instead install that software on one of our friend's computers as well. That would be software th theft that would be violating the copyright laws of the software. You know, intentionally erasing programs, uh, so malicious, you know, vandalism, illegally registering and or activating a program perhaps that didn't belong to us, or registering illegal copies. So again, you know, there's a lot of third world countries where this idea of copyright isn't as important, and thus a lot of the software that's being used there is actually pirated. But here, we want to make sure that we're following the rules, that we're being ethical, that we're paying for software that we use. And, and in actuality, there's an organization called the Software Alliance that is partnered with Microsoft and other large um, software manufacturers who can actually, through the end user license agreement that you clicked yes when you installed the software that you didn't read through, when you click that, a lot of times that gives those software manufacturers the ability to come in and check out um, your basically audit the number of software licenses you have. So many manufacturers incorporate an activation process. This has made it harder. You have to have a legitimate key. You have to activate. You can do it over the phone. Thus, we're not going to be able to activate the same key multiple times, which reduces piracy. And as we reduce piracy, we're reducing the cost of your software in the long run. So. If you haven't already, you know, every piece of software has what's called a EULA, an end user license agreement. Most of us just click right through that. But if you read that, there might be some real valuable information in there. For example, you might find out that you've bought a piece of software that you'd love to have on your smartphone. You'd love to have it on your laptop and maybe your desktop at home. Well, because you own all three of those, you can legally install that software three times, for example, with the one license key. But if you haven't read the end user license agreement, actually it might cost you money. If you're willing to pay two more times for that software, you might find out you just spent money you didn't need to. Also, you know, how you can install the software, who owns the software, can you modify the software? It's all in the end user license agreement. So information theft, the idea of stealing information. Now we've all we're all familiar with hacks. I've created other videos talking about you know major hacks. And uh, in part one, I talked about some pretty serious hacks. Well, that's information that's stolen. That could be confidential or personal information. How do we protect that information? Well, we expect that people holding our information in the cloud, hopefully if it's personal information that could be used for identity theft, that they're encrypting that information. They're encrypting our credit card numbers, our names, all that good stuff. So. It's a process of converting data that is readable by humans into encoded characters to prevent unauthorized access. Well, what do we need to de-encrypt it? We need a key. And a lot of times there's two keys, one held by where the data is encrypted and one that we might have. So no one else can read it without the two keys. Here's an example called public key encryption. So the sender creates a document to be sent via an email receiver. So I'm going to send that on. The sender uses the receiver's public key to encrypt the message. So that's a key everyone has, but the receiver uses his or her private key to decrypt the message. So if you notice, I need both keys. I need a key that would encrypt and another key that would decrypt. And if those keys don't match or work together, I'm not gonna be able to read that file. And then of course, the receiver can read or print the decrypted message. By the way, we also see this with double authentication where I might get an email that says, click here to read a message, and then I have to sign up for a service so that they can authenticate that it's me that should read the message. 
An example would be a healthcare provider sending you your explanation of benefits. You want to read those? You have to log into their site. You have to prove that you're that you're you when you created the account, and thus you'd be able to read that stuff. Another way um, of basically ensuring the reliability of a document is through a digital signature. It's an encrypted code that a person, website, or organization attaches to an electronic message to verify the identity of the message sender. Thus, you know it's legit, it's coming from them, you have that digital signature. If not a signature, then a certificate. A digital certificate is a notice that guarantees a user um, or a website is legitimate. So as we talked about HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secured, where anything transferring from their server to my computer back and forth is encrypted. And that's done with what's called an SSL, Secure Socket Layer Certificate. A third party has said, oh yeah, this is indeed US Bank. They've given them a certificate. And so when we get on that site, we can view that certificate and know that a third party confirms and identifies US Bank as US Bank. And that ensures that when we get communications or we're on their website, we're on the trusted website and not a website that just looks like theirs. So website that uses encryption techniques to secure its data is known as a secure site. Folks, just log into your uh, COCC webmail, you know, through www.coc student accounts click met webmail look up the https is there which means any emails being received or looked at by you or sent by you are encrypted back to that server so very important that we do this with any confidential information we definitely every time i go out to amazon although it looks like i'm at amazon site before i enter my my login information Thus check out, thus enter my credit card information. I'm looking for that HTTPS. It is a buyer beware. If you're not seeing what you're seeing right there, that HTTPS, you shouldn't be putting in usernames and passwords and credit card information and personal information because without that S, anything you're typing in is being transferred to that server, routed over the internet, routed through the World Wide Web in plain text, which means someone else could basically capture those packets of information and read them without having any encryption key. So of course today, hardware theft is the act of stealing digital equipment. Um, this is, you know, this is rampant when it comes to smartphones. They're so easy uh, for someone to steal. You leave it on, on your table when you go to the restaurant, you come back, it's gone because you went to the restroom. It's easy to steal these devices. And if you haven't encrypted the device, you're going to run into serious challenges trying to get your data back and get the device back, frankly. Hardware vandalism is the act of defacing or destroying digital equipment. A lot of times there's folks called hacktivists. We know what an activist is, someone who's you know really empowered about a certain cause or something. Well, hacktivists... What they'll do is let's say we've got a company that's doing bad things and destroying the environment. Hacktivists will hack into their website and maybe change their website to say, our company is bad, don't do business with us. You know, We kill baby kittens. Just an example, folks. Don't get all freaked out. You get the idea. So hardware theft, vandalism, and failure. When we talk about hardware theft, again, Think about how easy it would be for someone to steal a laptop. I actually years ago was traveling on business and I watched someone set their laptop right next to the seats they were sitting at. Someone just simply walked by when the person wasn't looking, grabbed it and, and started to walk off. Now, of course, I said something and you know yelled out and the person uh, dropped the laptop and ran off, but pretty easy to steal all these portable devices. We can secure them. We could put a lock in there. We have tracking devices that can go in the computer. If somebody then turns it on or connects it to the web, it'll track, it'll tell us you've seen this before, the find my phone. I'll demonstrate that in class, for example. Um, a lot of those things are now built in tracking apps. Physical security, you know, lock cables. Most laptops have a place 
that you can insert a cable so at least you can lock that cable around a chair around something that's going to be hard for someone to to steal it you know really a lot of times we're securing this from honest people who boy that's just too easy you know it would be too easy just to have a new laptop for example um, and then of course if we're talking about data centers and stuff like that we might spend hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars in security equipment and cameras and other things so we know who's coming who's going what they're getting to. We've already discussed surge protectors on interrupted power supplies. Not going to go through that again. You know, duplicate computers, we can talk about that, or fault tolerant, where we have two physical computers that can perform the same function. And basically, they both know that they're working. They both can work together. One will take over the load if one fails. We call that a fail over cluster. We cluster multiple machines together. That way, if the hardware fails, we don't lose the website. Can you imagine if a server failed at Amazon and you couldn't get on the site for 30 seconds? How much revenue do you think that costs? So when we talk about backups, which we've discussed in class previously on the previous lecture last week, uh, chapter four got into backups a little bit, but it's a duplicate of a file. Now, this doesn't mean you have to go out and spend money on backup software. You can literally go get a flash drive and say, oh, all my important files are in my documents. I keep everything in that my documents folder. You plug in the thumb drive that's large enough to hold all your my documents. You right click and copy. You now have a backup copy of those. Most people will use a third party software. It's sort of a set it and forget it type thing attached to either the cloud storage or to an external hard drive where they just literally say, back up my computer, boom, the whole thing is backed up. If they needed to restore it, they've created a little restore disk. It's part of uh, the process of setting up a backup system. Create a little restore disk, we put that in, we connect that other drive, or we connect to the cloud, and our data is restored. Folks, um, I want to bring this home on a personal level. Whether you have kids or not, whether you whatever the case may be back up your computer if if you're married and you have kids and and those kids grew up in a digital world you've taken digital photos from the time maybe they were born till the time they graduated high school like i did those photos are on my computer but i guarantee i have multiple backups of those photos in case my house was to burn down with my computer in it i have copies off site so always back up your data Here's another more important reason to back up your data. Today, we don't have CDs lying around with all the programs we buy and invest in. We downloaded those programs from the web directly to the computer we're going to use them on. Well, in some cases, that could be hundreds or even thousands of dollars of software that if your hard drive, whether it's a solid state or a spinny disk on your machine fails, do you have a way of restoring all that software you bought? Are you backing up all of those individual executable files and the license keys? Because if not, you might be rebuying software that you already own and calling those software companies and saying, hey, you know, I bought this software two years ago. Can I get it again? Most likely they're going to say no, but what you can do is we'll give you a discounted rate on the current version of the software. So make sure you're backing up your data. It's important. You if you're an audiophile like me, you're buying hundreds of dollars worth of music a year. It's on my computer. And again, if I lose my computer, if it gets stolen, which we've talked about, if I accidentally drop this soda that's sitting right next to the keyboard and boom, it fries the computer, I may not be able to get my data back. That would be pretty sad in all of those cases. So many types of backups. I don't really want to go through them in this class, but a full backup is always recommended if you have space. Backup everything. A differential is going to is a type of incremental backup, differential, incremental. They're going to back up only stuff that has changed since your last full backup. So it becomes a faster backup because I'm only backing up the files that have changed, new files that I've added, etc. Selective backup is where I actually go in and say, you know what? I'll restore the computer from a disk. That's not a problem. I've got all my software. Just back up my documents or just back up certain folders in my documents, for example. Today, though, continuous data backup to the cloud. 
So there's a program that you can install, many of them actually, that will run on your computer. That will, every time you change a file, it'll back it up to the cloud, for example. It keeps a copy. That's another version of set it and forget it. However, keep in mind, that's going to use a lot of data. So if your internet service provider um, bills you by the amount of data you use, you're going to use a lot of data going up and down from the web when you're backing up files. If nothing else, folks, you could use your OneDrive, which has a little space to back up your important stuff. You can be assured that Microsoft is encrypting your data when it's sitting on their servers. People aren't going to be able to get in and read it just because it sits in the cloud. Now, of course, you need a good, strong password and username because if I can guess your username and password, I can log into that cloud storage as if I'm you. So here is various backup methods, etc. I would highly encourage you take a minute, just pause, start with full backup, get down to cloud backup, and understand a little bit more about the advantages and disadvantages of each. I've kind of covered those. So finally, talking about wireless security. Well, wireless access point poses additional security risks. It certainly does. See, before, when there was only physical wires, you had to somehow gain access to a physical wire, plug it in your computer to be on that network. Well, today, we have wireless access points in our homes that extend far out from the walls of our homes. Matter of fact, mine's a very powerful device. It sits next to an outer wall. And the next street over, I can take my smartphone and go over to the next street and still connect to my internet service. What that means is if I can connect from the next street over, so could a hacker. So, uh, you know, basically, you know, connect to other wireless networks to gain free internet access. We call that neighbor net. By the way, it's not legal, okay? It is legal when you connect to a coffee shop because most likely the coffee shop is paying the internet service provider a larger fee to provide that service to their customers who come in for coffee. And yeah, it's built into the price of the coffee, folks. You're still paying for the internet. So other uh, connect to network through unsecured wireless uh, access point or a WAP or a combination router WAP. If it's unsecured, which means I can just log into it, a couple things to think about. If you can just log into it, so can someone else. And that means you're on a network that is unsecured. Someone might be able to read into your computer, look at the data you're sending back and forth on the web. You want that connection to be encrypted as well. So just like HTTPS, when we're, when we're searching the World Wide Web, we're looking for that HTTPS when we're putting in personal data. We don't want to put personal data across a network that is unsecured. We want to have to put in a security key, and thus we know that the data I'm sending from my computer to the access point is encrypted. No one else is going to be able to sniff that. Well, folks, that's where we're going to stop with this lecture. We'll come back for part three. Until then, take care.